All right. So in the back, um, our mics aren't working, so our projection is only our voice. If you guys want to move forward or anything, we'll try and fill the room. Uh, I know I can, but don't expect you to yell. <laughs> And so, I'm not known for being a loudspeaker. So. so so there you go. You might want to move forward if you can't hear. Um, but I'll, I'll gladly forward. repeat myself if I have to. Yeah. So if you guys aren't aware, this is Michael Hill, writer. You've done a lot of things in TV, but a lot of cartoons, G.I. Joe, Transformers, Space Usagi, Inhumanoids, Jim and the Hologram, a ton. But you're here this weekend. This is your second us kind of show. You were in Toronto for Transformers. Right. Uh, so the Transformer community has already embraced him. The Transformer Wiki has all of his episodes on it for Transformers. But for G.I. Joe, you did, you worked on several, but you were the main writer for two episodes. Three. three. I think I did three for Sunbow and two or three for Deke. Okay. I, I did not I, look up the Deke, sorry. But then I, I was a producer on the series, yeah. so I had supervised every episode. So you have a hand in all of them, but the reason why this was very special to us is because if we start the song, everyone in this room can sing <laughs> Cold Slither. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I don't know if that's been shouted at you a lot this weekend. Uh, this, actually, nobody has sung the song to me. Okay, so well. Interesting. The, the D-Class well, part. I mean, I'm not, I'm not asking. <laughs> We're going to get the finest to do it. Since they cosplay it, they, they're on the hook. <laughs> um, so with that, I know a lot of episodes had music. I know there was some royalty things with music. What brought, what brought Cold Slither to light? How did this come about? Well, uh, what's typical, whether you're a freelancer or on staff, and you want to get a, an assignment to write a, a script, you will pitch, if the story editor will even allow you to, you will pitch X number of premises, which are usually a page, page and a half, maybe two pages long, where you sort of break down, um, just in prose, the, the basic concept of the film, but in kind of in three acts. And usually they'll ask for a, a minimum of three, sometimes maybe it's five or six. And this is a conversation I never had with any other writers. But my own personal experience is, if it was three, I'd come up with two really great ideas that I had fully developed and I knew how I was going to write them. Because from the premise stage, it, once, if it gets approved, then you go to an outline where you literally break down each act. So that's like 10 or 12 pages. And when that gets approved, then you go and write the script. So it's a you know, three to four week process from premise to script. So what happens with me is I'll always be one short and I'll have a throwaway idea that I didn't get a lot of thought to, but I knew there was a kernel of something interesting in it. And nine out of 10 times, a story editor would pick the throwaway idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that from a few other people, yeah. yeah. And then it's like, oh crap, I gotta figure out what this story is about and how I'm gonna tell it. So that's what happened with Cold Slip. And it was essentially, because uh, the series was more fanciful than, say, the comic books, we were doing a lot of nutty ideas. And in some ways, we were always trying to top, competing with the other writers, trying to top the nuttiness. And so, um, Cole Slither was kind of a combination of a Pied Piper story and my poking fun at sort of the ridiculous lengths that Cobra would go to, and also poking fun at heavy metal music, which I was not a fan of in the 80s, because I came of age musically in the 60s. So, you know, I, I saw the Beatles live on Ed Sullivan that first night in 1964. And then, you know, in the mid-60s, you know, then you started having you know, Bob Dylan and the Birds and 
Buffalo Springfield, and then The Who, and Cream, and Led Zeppelin, and that's, that was my music. And all these clubs on the Sunset Strip, that in the 60s, that Jimi Hendrix would play at, or The Doors, were now becoming these heavy metal venues. So these guys, who I just thought looked ridiculous, <laughs> with their long hair, and their makeup, and playing these, what I thought were moronic songs <laughs> with really simplistic lyrics. So I was kind of poking fun at them. Um, so I write the, the, the script. I pretty much kind of made it up as I went along because it wasn't really well developed. And what we were doing with Jim, because they had contracted songwriters to create the songs, was, and what we would do in the script is when it would come to the scene where there'd be a, a, a song and a live performance, we would just literally write, play song here. <laughs> so I did that with, uh, with Cold Slither. And uh, I turned the script in, and then one day Tom Griffin and Joe Bacall, who owned Sunbow, which is a subsidiary of their advertising agency, <coughs> Griffin Bacall, come out to the West Coast, they come to the office, they walk down the hall, they come in my office, said, love the script, but where's the song? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you pitched this that you were going to write this script. And it included a song. I'm not going to pay somebody else to write the song. <laughs> so, um, so you have joined the pantheon of hair bands that you were trying to make fun of. Yes. So I, so I, I panicked nice. a little bit. So over the weekend, um, with guidance from my now ex-wife, who was a songwriter herself, but she specialized in English lyrics for Brazilian songs. Um, and she was working with you know, Sergio Mendes and, and people like that. So, all right, so my objective was to write a bad, heavy <laughs> metal song. And I didn't realize until um, actually quite recently is that I failed completely. <laughs> <laughs> and it apparently is an anthem more than it is a bad heavy metal song. And so that, that's how it came about. I, my wife had written the music for me. I sort of gave her the ideas um, that, I, that were in my head and she kind of knocked out something on the piano. And we gave that to, to Joe, and Joe said, well, we like the lyrics, but we don't like the music. And we already have Rob Walsh on contract, so we want him to write the music. So then I had to do the same thing with Rob. And I gave him a demo tape of, uh, I had, at the time, been collecting demo CDs by musicians who were basically creating a library music that they could sell for commercials or film trailers, and they would break it up into different genres. And so all the ones who were doing you know, hard rock and roll, heavy yeah. metal stuff, I, I would listen to that and go, okay, I, I, can, I can hear the lyrics to that, that kind of sound, and I would give it to Rob. And then Rob went and did his thing, and he sent me the tape, and I went, this is perfect. This is exactly the sound that I was looking for. So with that, did you find a love for this kind of music, or are you still think no. it's ridiculous? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you've made one we can all sing, and it's still not your gig. Yeah, but I will admit, it's really catchy. Because every time yeah. I hear it, I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was not, not my goal at all. Uh, the whole episode, I mean, we focus on that. The whole episode is great with giving kids the very cartoonish what you guys do in a studio, the kicking of chairs, the coke commander yelling, and the women coming in and you know, what the hell's going on. Like, the whole thing is, is very charming. Well, um, the whole music video thing is, before I got into animation, I worked in film production. So mostly commercials, 
So I was on a sound stage every day, and I was working with directors who like to wear their safari jackets <laughs> and their, their tinted uh, Ray-Bans and their ascots, and so I was kind of making fun of them, too. So this whole job is just your way of going, people, stop taking yourself so seriously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Um, I mean, after all these years, You've also had, um, because you worked on all of them, Cole Slither is just a very small part of what you've done for G.I. Joe. Right. And I know we've, we talked about the uh, Knowing is Half the Battle, the PSAs. How did those come about? And, and how many of those did you personally write, put together? Well. Because there's, what, 26 of them? 30. 30 of them. Four. 34 of them. You know, I had really, I remembered that I had done them, and in preparation for being here and realizing I'm going to have to talk about stuff I haven't really thought about in 40 years, um, I was really digging deep and trying to remember the chain of events and how things happen. And um, so, yes, I wrote the PSAs, and um, I was kind of convinced that. I had come up with the catchphrase, and I remember the experience I had in writing them. And there was a very popular uh, national NBC PSA campaign that ended with, the more you know. And I remember trading off of that. And the whole knowing is half the battle, I thought, it's not an original idea so many phrases ended in, you know, it's half the battle. However, and I did a lot of research, saying, okay, where did this come from? And everything led me back to the PSAs. I said, well, I wrote those damn kind of things. But a very reliable source informed me, I'm pointing at you, Tim, uh, just a couple of days ago, that uh, he had interviewed <clears throat> someone I never heard of or had any interaction with. And Griffin McCall, who claims that he wrote the first four and that he came up with that phrase. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, for whatever reason, he didn't have time to anymore <clears throat> and asked Joe to get you know, somebody in Sunbow West to write in because I was a producer of the show. It was my responsibility. So, my memory was I wrote them all and then I had created a catchphrase. I know I had to come up with a whole list of. Uh, ideas to send to Hasbro that they would, you know, rubber stamp some. Yeah, we like that. Go to the script or eh, not so much that one. And I thought I had done them all, but apparently I, again, according to a very reliable source, I did all but four. And it's Tim is one of our smartest people. I'm yeah, yeah. That, so I get it. And so. Um, so now I feel only comfortable in claiming that uh, I share some responsibility in making and knowing is half the battle become a popular catchphrase, which I wasn't aware of until about 15 years ago, a friend of mine's son told me about all these uh, videos yeah. on uh, YouTube where they had <laughs> rewritten the dialogue and I thought, those are great. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely a sign of, I loved this enough to put this level of effort into making fun of it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, most of us could probably quote those as well. I, it's funny, as an adult, we watch those PSAs and we go, did we like these as a kid? But yeah, we loved them as a kid. They were great as a kid. The PSAs were fun. See, I, and I wasn't aware of that because it, it, I don't know if Hasbro said this outright, but I was well aware of that we were up against Peggy Charon and Action for Children's Television. And she hated, not only did she hate our shows, but because they were glorified 22 minute commercials, but she came down on all kinds of shows and they were literally counting the number of acts of violence per minute. 
And it wasn't just G.I. Joe and Transformers. It could be duct tapes. Yeah. I mean, it could be anything. They, they really had a problem with that. And I guess there was some kind of loophole, thanks to Reagan, that allowed mm -hmm. uh, these kind of shows to get on the air in the first place. And I think the twisted logic was, oh, we're not promoting the toys, we're promoting the comic books. So, um, so I feel like this was, writing the PAs was their way to kind of soften and say, yeah, see, we are an educational show. Yeah. We're not just selling toys. <laughs> so um, they were really simple ideas. Um, you know, a, 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 a lot of them were based on things, you know, my mother would tell me when I was a kid, like, you know, we'd go to uh, the pond to go swimming, and then if you have lunch, well, you can't eat. You, know, you, got, you got to wait now right, to eat lunch before you can go in the water, which I think we all just accepted yeah. when we were kids. <laughs> you know, so like, what the hell is that all about? So they were, they were all kind of in that vein, and I just thought, as the viewers, that they would hate them. I mean, nobody right, turns their feet off early. You know, just these little more morality tales that are being kind of forced on them after just watching something that was you know, gloriously fun. I think most TV in the 80s was a morality tale of some sort, so no, nobody turned their TVs off early. Um, with, so, and outside of G.I. Joe, you've done a lot with Transformers. I know a lot of people in this room collect Transformers. You did a lot with Jim. You've been all over the place. What is what is next for you in terms of like how do you how do you want us to come to you like because we're all fans of what you've done we you have affected everyone in our childhood like this is fun for us we want you here how do we how do we accept you into this community how do we bring you in um, I guess just keep inviting me back now see. For many years, I was, I, I guess the best way I've been saying it is just out of the loop. Because after, when, when Hasbro decided we weren't going to do a third season of G.I. Joe, we weren't going to do another season of Transformer, and we were winding down everything else, and maybe even Jim, which I, I only did one episode of, okay. and that was under duress. <laughs> okay. A little sidebar. In addition to my my contract as a producer of, on staff, I had a pay or play contract to write a minimum number of scripts. And every year when we get close to the end of the contract and be ready for renewal, I was thinking, oh, I'm gonna get paid for not writing. <laughs> uh, and, and, and they sweep in at the last minute and say, uh, you're gonna write a jam. And I was like, oh, I'm not that guy. So I tried to pitch stories to Hasbro that I knew that they would hate and wouldn't want me to write. And uh, so this one episode called Out of the Past, uh, the basic premise was the girls find uh, their father's diary in the attic. And so all the backstory that was never sort of dramatized in the series. They'd read an entry and we'd you know, cut to a flashback. And one of the big deals was that Jem's mother had been a folk singer in the 60s and she had died. And I don't think it was ever explained how she did. So taking a page out of uh, uh, Clark Gable's life, who was married to Carol Lombard. And, and, and again, the connection is, um, my wife and I were friends with Sergio Mendez. We used to go to his house for dinner, and he had bought Clark Gable's house that he had built for his wife, Carol Lombard, to live in. So I had this great scene, I thought it was great, where you see them, she's on tour in the plane, flying along, and then there's uh, you know, some kind of mishap, and it slams into the side of the mountain, burst, the you know, big explosion, burst of flames, and she's killed. And it's a big sob story in the press. And I thought, there's no way they're going to they're gonna go for that. Because we just don't kill characters in these shows. And they loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I ended up writing a gym. Um, 
but I'm not answering your question. No, no, this is um, answering it. This is great. So, oh, so, so we, we kind of all went our separate ways after that. I think they were they're finishing up some My Little Ponies and Blow Worms or, or something, some kid, kitty stuff. And um, so, it, you know, we were all just looking for our next gig, assuming it would be in animation. And mine turned out to be, I went to work for a graphic design company as a uh, in-house producer and copywriter, because we were doing music videos and title sequences for films, and we were doing uh, record album covers and packaging for software and things like that. And uh, then next year I got an opportunity to work with Marv Wolfman over at Disney, and we were editing the comics in the Disney Adventures magazine, which was something new at the time, that would be right next to the TV guide at the checkout counter at the grocery store. And occasionally, the editor of Disney Comics that was doing DuckTales and Tailspin and Chip and Dale would get overloaded, because uh, Marv and I were always way ahead of schedule. We had our, our, our books planned months in advance and had our work ready to go to print. They'd ask us to you know, edit some of those titles. And, uh, this is, and from there, I you know, get a call from Dick Giordano at DC Comics, and he wants me to come to New York and be the editor for this new line of uh, collected edition trade paperbacks. Coincidentally, my wife gets a job with Polydor Records in New York, so it's like, well, I So. I won't bore you with everything else, but I ended up, you know, and then that led into me working for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So first as a consultant, and then creative director. And ended up in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so just a, a series of new opportunities after I left Sunbo, and I didn't really give, it was just some, you know, it had been a job, the job that I enjoyed. It was, uh, I mean, we were all very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time and had this great sandbox to play in. And um, probably we all did our, our, if we didn't do our best work, we had the most fun yeah. doing that work. Because we were making it up as we went along. We had no idea that it would not that it would evolve into a billion dollar franchise. So there was no, no pressure to be, you know, precious about how we handled it. It was just, plus also, it was like working at a factory. So we just had to crank stories out every yeah. week. Every week, got to get a new script, send it to Marvel, get the story of board artists, get into production, make our deadline for the show to air. So when that's going on, you're not really getting the feedback that most of us are having arguments with mom and they want us to turn None, off the TV. We had no interaction with fans at all. And so, had, I mean, we knew we were doing okay in the ratings, Yeah. but other than that... Interesting. So I know a few of us have seen like the Griffin of the Call Bible for some other commercials, but I haven't seen one for, for like the shows. I mean, were you guys getting a lot, like every season as the new toys are coming out? Are you getting yes. new Bibles? Are you getting new well, we're getting guides? New, or yeah, new style guides. Um, I'm pretty sure by the time I came on board, because they had already done, I think, one season, or maybe it was just a miniseries. They, they had the, the five, the five right. part miniseries. And so I came on the started, board yeah. in 85, spring of 85. And so I think the first thing I got was a three ring binder that was like the Bible. And so it basically had uh, the model sheet of the character, character's name, a brief bio of the character, you know, weaknesses, strengths, and what was really helpful, and not every studio does this, is sample dialogue. I mean, it was more helpful, well, I guess it was helpful in both shows, but it really gave me a sense of how the characters spoke and made it easier for you to get inside their head and think the way they did. So, and then, you know, every time they would release new toys, then they would just send faxes of those sheets and we'd just add them to the, to the Bible. From a writer's perspective, I know from like an animators and the comic books and everything else, 
from a writer's perspective, were you guys also given any of the toys or the prototypes or anything to have around the office? Yes. That you could, and do we still have those? Well, Hasbro <laughs> would send us cases uh, of everything. Yeah. So in my office, I have you know, a huge shelving unit. I'm just every figure, transformer figure, and every GI Joe figure. It was great. Take them out of the box or blister cards, and so I had you know something three dimensional versus a two dimensional piece of art. Yeah. And because you know, I'm visually oriented, so I think. Even when I'm reading a newspaper article, I'm, I'm, I'm visualizing it as film in my head. And so that, for me, it makes it easy to write, because yeah. I just write what I, what I see. Um, and then we just put them away. And, uh, I, and they even sent us a, a USS flag that we <laughs> used nice. as our coffee table <laughs> in our little lounge room, where we had our you know, television set that we'd watch. Videos so how many there. coffee stains were on that? You know, <laughs> that was a concern that we would mess it up somehow, yeah, but we never did. And I remember us being like, be very careful. We just um, didn't, ended up not abusing it whatsoever, yeah. so that was kind of cool. So anyway, the answer to the question is, uh, I did not think that, that, that that once the show was canceled, the, the toys, nobody would care about toys. Yeah. And all that stuff would just go away. Something new would come along to replace it. And um, there'd be no value. So I ended up giving all those toys to my son, who, you know, of course, sure. he's five years old. As all of us did. Yeah. And so I, I didn't. Other than um, copies of storyboards and hard copies of scripts that I wrote, and you know the original uh, Bibles and the binders and stuff like that, I didn't really keep anything. So it's not until now, 40 years later, it finally occurs to me. Uh, while I'm at an age where uh, you know it's too late in the game for me to become a serious collector, but I thought I should at least have copies of things that I created or helped contribute to me. And so when I went to Toronto, the night I arrived, I find out Hasbro's come out with a, a figure of a character that I created. I thought, well, I need to have this. And then I realized quite recently that I never, get, never did get a Captain Claymore in the Special Mission Brazil. Which we didn't even talk about. So you, uh -oh. with Captain Claymore, that was a that was a store exclusive target. Toy, the Toys R Us. Toys R Us. But you, you had a huge hand in. Did you write the entire script for the? Yes. The audio tape. Yes. So for all of us that have that tape, the back side is blank for kids to record their own stories on, to, you know, to for us to match what you've put on the front yeah. side of the tape. Which I don't remember. If that was their, it must have been their plan, and, it, and so they must have told me, or in fact, I knew that, but it was something I had forgotten about. But that was another thing, as much as a producer of the show, I got a fax either directly from Hasbro or via Carol Weitzman, who was a VP at Sundo, and kind of our go-between between, between um, Hasbro and Sundo West. And it, it, it was that um, they're doing an exclusive with Toys R Us, and uh, it's going to be five figures, and four of them are going to be existing figures, but they want to create a new one, and they're going to create it out of spare parts. And, and I didn't even know what those parts were, but my responsibility was to come up with the name, come up with the code <coughs> name, come up with this origin, this bio for the file card, and then it was, oh, by the way, we're also going to include an audio cassette with a little radio drama, and we want you to write the script. And it, was, and it wasn't called anything. So I created Captain Claymore. I called it Special Mission Brazil, which is kind of a tribute to my wife because of her Brazilian connections. That's and uh, wrote, and, and then I had remembered that my father 
when he was a kid, used to talk about how he'd sit by the radio and listen to the Lone Ranger and the Shadow. So I really wanted to have that kind of old, old timey radio drama feel to it. Yeah, so, you know, I turned all that stuff in and then just kind of forgot about it. They did not, because I had supervised all the recording sessions for Transformers and G.I. Joe in Los Angeles, you know, working with Wally Burr and the actors, they did not use any of those actors for the, the tape. So I think they recorded it all in New York and they never sent me a copy. So I never even heard it until about 10 days ago. I found on YouTube somebody had posted yeah. the audio, and I went, oh, this is interesting. Have you gone back and gotten yourself a Claymore figure, finally? I just, I found, I didn't think I was going to do it, because when I was talking to Brian, he was telling me how it was a holy grail, and see, yes. 500,000, 1,000 dollars on it, so well, I, I, yeah, I'm never going to pay that kind of money for it, and it's like, oh, I should have done that 20 years ago. But um, after talking with Brian, I happened to stumble upon a YouTube video of a guy who does a podcast called Needless Things. Yes. And he was very excited that he had just got the Special Mission Brazil set. He was showing off all the characters. At the end of the video, he had a surprise to show that he had discovered some guy who makes these custom designed display stands for characters and he had the guy design stands. He says, I'm not going to do it for all my characters, that's, that's too much, but I'm going to do it for Special Mission Brazil. And he had this guy design them and I thought, oh, those are great. I, I, I need to have one, even though I don't have the figures, maybe I will get the figures, but at least I'll have the stand in case if I wait till they get to figures and this guy you know, drops dead and he's not making them anymore. <laughs> so, and he only charges $15 for these things. And they're, they're I think, it's with it. He makes them for uh, a lot of the figures. Yeah. He, I, I think I've seen a Crimson Guard one, I've seen a Viper one. Yeah, I went to his Facebook page yeah. and dozens and dozens of different designs. So, I contacted him. And he, he said he'd love to do it, would not let me pay him, even though it was only $15. And I had casually mentioned that I was coming to the show and, you know, I had done Cold Slither and it turns out he's a big Cold Slither fan. <laughs> I said, it'd be nice to do that, do a display stand for Cold Slither, but I've been out of the loop for so long, I don't even know if those figures exist. So I thought it would be a conversation <laughs> we would have down the road. So last Tuesday, just a couple of days before I'm ready to fly out, uh, fly out I get a package from him, and it's the two uh, Special Mission Brazil display stands, one for Claymore and one for the audio tape, which I also don't have. And I thought, well, if I just get a, a black cassette tape, it'll at least give the appearance Yellow. of what it designed for. And he included the Cold Slither display stand. It's like, this is amazing. And those are at your table right now. They're at my table box. right now. And I, and I have a little um, sheet of paper that has his contact information. Because I said, if you're not going to let me pay you, let me promote you. Um, but then I said, oh, it'd be so bad. It'd be so much better. If I came to the show and I had these display stands and I actually had something to display, so I thought, all right, I'll go on U eBay and see you know, how much I'm really going to have to drop for one of these Claymore figures. And uh, some of them were really, you know, by now, really high price. Some of them, a lot of them were, you know, broken. Yeah. This bid starts at $99. I said, well, if I'm going to spend that kind of money. I don't want a broken one. And I found a really good deal on a pristine one and I just pulled the trigger. So now I have a cap play one. And the other figure that you had mentioned at the start of this was a Transformer. Yes. And so I know we're not a Transformer show, but it is, it's 
very cool that you just threw a transformer into, a, into one of your scripts, not thinking about whether or not you can, and now we have this fan favorite transformer. Uh, that was that was the bounty hunter episode. Yes, the, the rambler episode. The gambler. Gambler episode. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, quick. So if you like transformers. Yeah. So the quick story, because I know it's transformers. So we don't want to get off topic. Very first episode of Transformers I ever wrote, I was still freelancing. Uh, I hadn't even been interviewed with Sunbo yet. I don't even think I knew Sunbo was even opening an office in, uh, in Los Angeles. Got the Bible. Uh, I think I saw the miniseries. I got a list of shows that it, scripts had already been written and ones that were sort of in production or development. And again, had to um, come up with a minimum number of scripts, and I was one short. So I had written an episode of GoBots for <laughs> Hannah Barbera. And the, a lot of it got rewritten to the point where I didn't recognize my show. So I took my throwaway idea was. I resubmitted the same press premise <laughs> that I had submitted to GoBots. Wow. And they bought it. <laughs> so, the, but the one thing was that nobody told me I couldn't create my own Transformers, which uh, doesn't make sense to me why they, why they didn't. Hasbro wants to sell toys. their toys. So, you got to use those toys. And, um, but I had created this character who was a bounty hunter, and I went down the list, all the Decepticons and all the Autobots, and there was nobody that you could call an Autobot. And again, let me say up front, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't really have a handle on the show at all. It didn't make any sense to me. I couldn't find you know, a, a point of angle that I could ground it into <coughs> something that I, it could all make sense, even any kind of internal logic. I, I mean, the biggest thing was I didn't understand why they turned into cars in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and the bounty hunter in my head, he wasn't really, he was, definitely wasn't a bad guy, but he wasn't really a good guy. He was, he was moral, he was tough. Um, but, you know, he was on a mission to uh, go after bad, mostly Decepticons, bad Transformers in general. So I just made them up. And uh, like I say, nobody told me I couldn't. And so um, I never thought about it again. The show goes on the air. To me, it was just a, it was a throwaway episode. It was a throwaway, throwaway character. And uh, over time, uh, much later though, I started hearing that he was a fan favorite, that I had no idea. So this seems to be your pattern. Yeah. Something yeah. that you're not, you're not too concerned with, we all fall in love with. Yeah. And then almost 40 years later, Hasbro finally acknowledges him and comes out with a DevCon figure in their new legacy line. And so for those of us that do both G.I. Joe and Transformers, yeah. DevCon is yours, just like Playmore is. Did you do any of the other like cassette tapes that they did for GI Joe Transformers stuff like that, or was it just the Mission just, Brazil? Just special mission. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not even aware of any other. There were a handful. Yeah. None of there's only two that are really like from collector's standpoint are expensive and mm -hmm. and sought after. Mission Brazil being one of the two. Uh, this is awesome. I I know we have. I think 11.20 is our stopping point, so I've been trying to signal that I'm good, I'm bad at reading lips. It's 11.16. It's 11.16, so we should wrap it up. Okay. Um, I, honestly, I just, I, I personally appreciate, ever since you showed up with us uh, Thursday night, you've hung out with all of us. You're very charming, you're very giving of your time. Um, and so if you haven't stopped by the booth and had this conversation, Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining our community after you've been absent for 40 years. And hopefully we all will like show you the love and keep you coming back.
Uh, yeah, well, thank you because I I didn't come here to you know hide out in my room and spend a lot of hours <laughs> sleeping. I wanted to hang out with you guys because I had such a great time at the Joe convention because it was really eye opening to hear from the fans' point of view what the stuff we did how it resonated with it because we got no feedback whatsoever other than we knew how it was doing in the, in, in the ratings. But you know, once it was off the air, there were no ratings. So um, just completely oblivious to the reception of any of the things that we had done uh, and meant to anyone. And also, at some point, I'll try and be really brief because then we gotta go. I heard at BotCon in 2014 in Pasadena, one of their exclusive for that year was a DevCon character. And I thought, oh wow, this will be the only time I'll, I'll ever get it. You know, it was a small, simple, tiny thing. And so I contacted them, introduced myself, and said, it'd be really nice if I could get one of those. Oh, well, come on by. So <laughs> I thought, oh, well, you're doing this big show. You've got all these guests here. I thought, well, maybe they'll want to include me. But no, that, I didn't get it. So I, I get there. <laughs> I meet my contact person, he gives me this little plastic bag, and it was basically, well, okay, thanks for coming by, we'll see you. And I, so I just figured that nobody, for whatever reason, I tried not to take it personally, but for whatever reason, nobody was interested in the writers. It kind of ruffled my feathers a little bit because it had become such a big franchise and I wanted to believe that the work that we had done, both G.I. Joe and Transformers, laid the groundwork for what the franchise ultimately became. And I couldn't understand why nobody would be interested in the original writers, and especially those who worked at Sunbow. But I let it go. And so it was only, I think, the first time anybody so I did similar things and got no response from Joe Kahn or uh, other Transformer events. Yeah, I mean, they didn't even say thanks but no thanks. They just didn't respond to emails. So um, TF Con contacted me for the first time in 2019. Uh, I think late in the game, because I was in Hawaii on vacation. So I said, well, I come back Saturday night so I could show up on Sunday at, you know, afternoon for a couple hours. And um, so, but I didn't really get the con experience until this past summer. And I went, wow, this is a lot of fun. These are great people. I want to uh, do more of this. So it kind of worked the same way with Brian when uh, he started promoting this event. And then I, I saw the Cold Slither connection. So, well, as the original creator, I approve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Brian's fantastic. It's, it's great that he's brought you in. Um, so Toronto and now Des Moines and hopefully more next year. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm talking to people at Joe Fest, yeah. so maybe that'll happen. And uh, there was a guy in uh, Lake Georgia, New York, who said he wants to do a Joe show I think first weekend in May and wants me to come out for that, which would be great because it's not, it's like an hour and a half drive to my hometown where all my Joe and Transformer stuff is in storage. <laughs> <laughs> and I can get that stuff and bring it back. Well, if you if you show up in Des Moines again or at Joe Fest or any other Joe show, um, we'd love to have you. Great, I'd, I'd, I'd love to be there. Thank you for doing this. All right, thank you. have a quick question that we didn't cover? So at the close of the fantastic episode, and at the ending, there's this really haunting image with mainframe and Sabrina. And the kind of Romeo and Juliet aspect of it, did you ever think about touching on it again? At the end of Cold Slither? Yeah. That was the end of computer complications. Oh, my bad. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Another right. question. Uh, you said you worked on the D series as well. Yes. Uh, and the D series doesn't get as much attention uh, as the Sunbow series, kind of among the fans, but it seems to have a different tone than the Sunbow series. Did, did you have a did you have a different direction uh, or a different approach to the D series? Uh, not me personally. Doug Booth, who worked with us at at Sunbow, was hired to be the story editor. So. I don't know if he developed that new approach, um, but he just called me up and said, hey, you want to you wanna write a few scripts? I think he was calling everybody who had worked on G.I. Joe at Sunboat. And I said, sure. Now, I had worked for Deke before. I was familiar with the kind of work they did, so I knew what I, what I was getting into. But it definitely had a different sensibility than I was used to. But I have to admit, uh, well, first of all, I've never seen the episodes because I can't watch any Deke show. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but I have to admit, I kind of just took the money and ran. It was like, it was an easy payday, um, but it did not feel like it was the same show at, at all that I was working on. That's probably why it doesn't get a lot of love for most of us either. <laughs> uh, which ones did you write? Was it just an officer and a viperman? Officer and a viperman, shadow of a doubt. And if, a, if there was a third one, I can't remember what the title was. Those were good. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you. Those are entertaining. 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 Those that's again. That's I'm I'm glad to hear it because I've never seen them and I've never heard anyone talk about them. Well, some of us were born. Or we were oh, been, I we see. Been yeah. Ten years old at that time. So, so that would be your introduction. Yeah, I always okay. like watching those. Always. Uh, the reason I bring it up is precisely because a lot of those fans from that era are now coming into the community and there's now becoming more interest in uh, the V series and yeah, not as many people have talked about it so. Basically, anything that you can say about it is probably new information. Oh, okay. Now, is, there, uh, is the value of the, the figures, is that increased at all? Yes. They are starting to go up. Oh, now. okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And, and were they as well made as, as the, um, yeah, they the were. original? Yeah, all right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still in that Some 13 of years of what we call the real American hero. That's the 13 years of love before they had a break in the line, and that's where everybody, after that, everybody's like, well, we tapered off, but that was 13 years. A lot of us older guys are like 82 to 86, and then we, okay, we'll get 87, now 88. Yeah, yeah. And we end up at 94, but. Oh, okay. But yeah, so then Deke was the only animation we had at the time. Yeah. And, I get, and I guess Metalhead <clears throat> was exclusive to the Deke shows? Yes. Because I did, I'm not sure if I wrote any episode he was in. Um, but he wasn't familiar to me, but I recently discovered there's a new six inch? Plus, plus, yeah. 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 yeah, and that he has this cold slither yeah, yeah, mask. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, do I need to get one of those? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I didn't know anything about the character at all. Time to go, Brad? I mean, Brian? I, yeah, I okay. think we're ready to uh, 